Dr. Timothy Burrow is a lecturer at the University of Essex. After completing his PhD at Cambridge on the link between diet and bowel cancer, he moved into the field of epigenetics, and he will explain that. Um, Dr. Barrow has worked on CLL for the past decade, which is good news for us. Oh, thank you. That's clever. It's my job of button pressing out the window. Um, he's been at Newcastle University, Sunderland, and is now a lecturer at the University of Essex. Thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Over to you. Okay. So thank you for the nice introduction and for giving me the opportunity to speak today. So I'm going to talk a bit about my own personal work with genetics and epigenetics and CLL and talk about the wider field as well. And just to introduce myself very quickly at the start, uh, I'm a molecular biologist, so I don't have a clinical background. I did a degree in biochemistry. Uh, and I've been working in the field of cancer epigenetics in general for about 12 years. I started off working on bowel cancer, first of all, and breast cancer. Uh, and then I, I moved to Newcastle to do a postdoc position there, which is what you do after your PhD. And I began to focus on CLL. And it's something that I have been doing ever since. Uh, and I was a lecturer at Sunderland for, for, for five years. And then in January, I moved to Essex. And this gives me a bit more time for research. So I'm hoping to start my research group looking at uh, the epigenetics of CLL. So part of what I want to do today is to talk about my own work and work in the field. But part of my reason for coming here today is to better understand what the needs are. Because I think if you purely work in research, you're not aware of everything that's required. So I'd like to find out a bit more today about where I should direct my research effectively. So I'm going to be talking about genetics. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail, but I appreciate that most people here probably don't have that much knowledge about what genetics is. So to very briefly describe things, the body is comprised of millions of cells, and in each of these, it's proteins that perform most of the work. Your genome, your DNA, is the recipe book for making every single protein that a cell requires. And the way this is done that DNA is a long series of four bases, A, C's, G's, and T's. And the order of them is basically the recipe for how to make a protein, to which amino acids would, would go into making it. And if you ever hear the phrase gene expression, that is referring just to switching a gene on and producing protein from it. We've heard about mutations this morning. You may not be exactly clear about what a mutation is. And it's basically just where you get a change in that base sequence. So here at the bottom, I've got a short DNA sequence beginning CAG. Uh, now, if you look to the right, you'll see that that third base, which I've highlighted in a blue color, has changed. So it's gone from a G to a T. So that is what we're referring to with a mutation. And even though it's one small change, that can actually have quite a profound effect. So sickle cell anemia is actually caused just by a single base change like that. So how can mutations give rise to cancer and potentially to CLL? Well, there's two ways in which mutations can have an effect, potentially. The first is by making a protein very active. So sometimes we get these activating mutations where uh, basically it frees the protein of all the normal checks and balances that we find in cells. So normally everything in a cell is under very tight control. So Cells don't just grow all the time. They sort of keep everything uh, under close control. But when you get a mutation in the gene, that can potentially lead to the protein just being free of that control and just driving cell growth. So there's a gene called KRAS, which drives a lot of different cancers. It's not particularly important for CLL. There's a gene called NOTCH1, which is more important for driving cell growth there. Conversely, a mutation can render a protein non-functional, or at least limit its function. And this is important if that protein is a brake pedal on cell growth, or if it fixes DNA mutations. So TP53, which we heard about this morning, it's the most commonly mutated gene across all cancers, sometimes known as the guardian of the genome. Uh, you might be familiar with a gene called BRCA1, which is linked to breast and ovarian cancer. 
that repairs DNA mutations effectively. So if you've inherited a mutation in BRCA1, you're not able to repair DNA damage as effectively. So that's with cancer in general. In terms of what we see with CLL, we see different changes at different time points. Now, the first thing is that if you compare CLL to other malignancies, what you find is actually it's very variable. With a lot of cancers, there'll be key genes that get mutated in maybe 50% of patients. But in CLL, we see a wider range of genes, each of which is mutated in maybe 5% of patients. So it's a lot more variable from person to person with the disease. Secondly, these mutations are not always present at the point of diagnosis. So cancers evolve over time. They acquire new mutations, new epigenetic changes. Uh, and so what we see at the point of diagnosis isn't necessarily the finished story. So if we go from monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, which uh, was touched upon earlier today, to early CLL at the point of diagnosis, and then to something like disease, which has become resistant to therapy or Richter's transformation, we see different genetic changes time points. We see these big chromosomal changes early on. Then we begin to see mutations in individual genes at the point of diagnosis. And there was a question earlier about why do some cases of CLL progress more than others? It can be because of new muta mutations which are acquired during disease progression, things like TP53 and SF3B1. So some of these mutations that are acquired over time can be really important for how someone might respond to their therapy. So a mutation in TP53 will impair the response to fladarabine. Mutations in BTK or PLC gamma 2 can impair the response to ibrutinib. So it's quite important to understand. Now I've said I've worked, or I do work in epigenetics, uh, which is quite a trendy term these days, but you may not be familiar with what this is. So your genome is the recipe book, and you can maybe think of epigenetics as the traffic lights for how genes get switched on and switched off. So I work on something called DNA methylation, which is where your DNA gets chemically modified, it gets methylated, to switch a gene off. So your genome has 20,000 genes, and you don't need all of these being on all the time in every single cell of the body. You don't need your white blood cells to be producing neurotransmitters and so on. So DNA methylation is a perfectly normal regular, regulatory process for monitoring gene ex for regulating gene expression. But in cancer, what we see is that methylation gets added to genes where it shouldn't be, and it's taken away from places where it's required. So a bit like mutations, what we can find is that genes that drive growth will suddenly be switched on and those which might be the brake pedal or which might repair DNA damage get switched off. And the job of people like me is to identify where do we see changes in DNA methylation in CLL and what kind of impact does it have, if anything. And that takes a lot of detective work. So I'm going to talk about two areas that have worked. The first of which is looking for changes that are present at the point of diagnosis. So. The group I was in was not the first to look at this, but I took a slightly different approach. Most people, when they study this, it, it's big data. They are looking at hundreds of thousands of data points at once per individual. And you're just seeing the bigger picture and analyzing the broader patterns. What I did is a targeted approach to specific regions of the genome. I'm not going to go into detail about what regions they are, because that's complex. And we analyzed this in 163 individuals with CLL. 24 of whom were up in the northeast of England, 139 are based in Spain, and the data was made uh, freely available. So I drilled down on these areas, and I was able to identify some changes which are unique to CLL, and they're really common across patients. So with this graph, if you look at the vertical axis, it's DNA methylation. So at the top, it's 100%, and lower down, it's 0%. And going from left to right, we have a series of groups. We have three cohorts of healthy individuals in blue. And hopefully what you can make out is that there are very high levels of methylation across the board, if I use the cursor. So these three groups here, very high levels of methylation. If we then look at CLL in red, 
we see very low levels of methylation across most patients. In other forms of leukemia and lymphoma, we again see high levels. So these changes are unique to CLL. We're not seeing them in other leukemias. What is more, oh, slides got slightly distorted, uh, but we see these changes prior to diagnosis. So I collaborated with the Melbourne Collaborative Cohort Study in Australia, and they have what are called prospective samples. So these are blood samples from taken, these are blood samples taken from individuals who are healthy at that time, and they're followed up for about 20 years, and if they are diagnosed with cardiovascular disease or diabetes or cancer, it's recorded, and then you can look back, go back to those blood samples and see what kind of things are going on. Can we identify any genetic or epigenetic changes? So the little blue box there highlights about seven people who were uh, within seven years of their diagnosis, so diagnosed up to seven years after the blood sample was taken, and we could already see a drop in methylation there. So that gives us a clue that these changes might have an important role in how CLL originates. So these kind of epigenetic changes appear to, to originate quite early on in the progression of the disease. Uh, and some of these are really frequently present across patients, much more so than with mutations. So we've identified these changes which are detectable prior to diagnosis, and we're following this up now to better understand uh, how they might be involved, if at all. So I'm afraid it's a little bit cut off. But first of all, we're going to look to see how these changes originated. Did they originate as the product of an environmental exposure? Is it because of a natural cell process, which has just given rise to these? And then what kind of an impact do they have, if any? Third thing that I'm looking to do, uh, which I can't talk about today uh, for sort of IEP reasons, is we're looking to see if these kind of changes could be used as diagnostic markers. Could it could be the, the basis of a new clinical test? The, er, the other area that I've worked is looking at changes that occur after someone has been treated. So previously, there has been some kind of analy analysis of DNA methylation uh, later in, at the stage of the disease, but it was believed that everything was very stable. And I think that's just because it was a bit of an afterthought. They'd have a number of samples taken from individuals at diagnosis. They might have one or two which were taken later. They've analyzed them quickly and thought, doesn't look like much is different. We had grounds to believe that actually that might be incorrect. So with 20 individuals uh, with CLL based in the northeast of England, we had samples before and after they were treated. And we compared their DNA methylation at these two time points. And through some slightly complex analysis, we identified 31 different genes which show a difference between these time points. So with this graph, uh, in red, we have normal B cells. In blue, we have individuals with CLL before they're treated, and in green, after they're treated. So hopefully what you can make out here is that the levels of methylation for this specific gene, which I haven't annotated, are low normally in B cells, but they go up in CLL at the point of diagnosis, and they go up even further after a patient has been. But it's not uniform across all individuals. This looks a bit complex, so I'm going to try my best to explain it. You can imagine each of these columns here is a different patient, and each row is one of these 31 genes. And it's color coordinated according to the size of the methylation change that we're seeing. So if you've got a dark red color like here, it's a big gain of methylation. What if it's a dark blue color, it's a big loss. And so hopefully what you can see here is that on the right, we have individuals showing quite big changes after they've been treated. Well, on the left here, it's quite faded, it's quite washed out. Those individuals aren't showing such a big change. It seems to be very stable. So it's not a uniform thing, thing that we see across all individuals. Now, having identified these 31 genes, the obvious question is, what do they do? Are they relevant? Are they having any effect? So we started off with some statistical analysis to look at which of these 31 might be having the biggest impact. 
and we basically drilled them down to three that we thought were having a significant impact on prognosis. And so these are three ones that we'll look at first uh, and we'll perform experiments on. And the way that we do this is that we can grow cells in the lab in a flask like this one. So it's a plastic flask. And that red color there is the culture media. And you grow the cells in there. And you can manipulate the cells to switch that particular gene on or off. So in the middle there, we've got a microscope image of the cells. This is what they look like. We are changing them to switch a gene on or off. Uh, and then we can expose the cells to different drugs. And we can see whether it has any kind of Im impact. And what we found is that there was one gene in particular called HOXA4. And with this gene, we were seeing an increase in methylation in our individuals with CLL. So that means the gene's getting switched off. And in these cells, if we switch the gene off, we find that fewer of them will die when exposed to fladarabine, to ibrutinib, and idelalazib. Those were the three drugs that we tested. So that gives us a bit of understanding about why we might be observing what we do that maybe this gene is being switched off over time and it's making the CLL cells a bit less sensitive to the different drugs that someone might be given. So we're kind of the first people to, to show that there are these changes in DNA methylation over time. And we've shown that actually these can be impactful. It's not just something that happens and it's of no consequence but potentially it could actually be having an impact on how sensitive the cells are to different types of therapy. So we're following this up at the moment uh, to better understand the impact of these range of genes, and it will help us to understand how drug resistance can emerge. It's usually believed to be a genetic thing, where you gain a mutation in a particular gene, and that means that you may not respond as well as, as you used to. But here, there might be epigenetic mechanisms which switch genes on and off, and that might be having an impact there. Now, we heard a bit this morning about, um, about deciding which course of therapy to go for. And in a perfect world, it'd be great if there could be some test which could determine whether an individual was going to respond to a particular drug or not. At the moment, we don't really have this, but it is an obvious aim, and it's something to, to work towards. Can we identify genes which will give us a, a good understanding of will an individual respond to a calibrutinib or venetoclax? So that's something to work towards. So we're looking at these 31 genes in more detail. We're trying to understand what they do. Um, I have a hypothesis about how they might sort of rewire leukemic cells as the disease progresses. And ideally, we'd be looking to develop some sort of clinical biomarkers that could be used to predict therapy. That, unfortunately, is very difficult to do, but it is something that we are trying to. So with that, hopefully I've helped to explain that genetic and epigenetic analysis can be really important in understanding how CLL originates, how it progresses, and how drug resistance uh, may arise. Talked a bit about uh, some of the work that I've been involved in, looking at changes at diagnosis during the course of treatment. And this is all ongoing. We're trying to understand what impact these changes have. Uh, and the long-term goal is always to, to identify things like clinical biomarkers that could be used. So with that, I'd like to thank my former colleagues at Newcastle and the Melbourne Collaborative Cohort Study for the sort of pre-diagnostic samples. I've worked at Newcastle and Sunderland and most recently Essex, and these are the funders who have generously supported our work. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much.